Mary Beard, welcome to 7.30. Thank you, it's great to be here. Tell me this, why are we still so fascinated with the rulers of ancient Rome? I think it's because they provide a perfect template for us, for power. Sometimes power well used, but more often power abused. And they've been that for 2,000 years and we're still using them. So who decided what were the stories of these men? Who fixed the narrative? Who told us that Nero did or didn't play his fiddle or his lyre while Rome burnt? Who told us the stories about Caligula? Where did these stories come from? Well, we find them written by kind of slightly austere, often ancient historians, Roman historians, writing usually after the reign in question, you know, and it's easy it's easier to be more critical of an emperor once he's dead. Mm -hmm. So we have it, as it were, bona fide Latin texts telling us about them. Now, those are where we get, you know, the stories you mentioned, Nero fiddling while Rome burned, Caligula thinking about making his horse a consul, all those ones. How true they were or where they originated or who first told them before they got into these Roman historians who, who copied them down, that's a $64,000 question. And you know, it seemed to me that probably quite a lot of them are not literally true. So what purpose do they serve as history then? Well, what they tell you is what Romans thought about their emperors. I mean, I think it's a bit like celebrity gossip. I mean, you know, I, I know that half of what we read about Harren and Meghan can't possibly be true. Mm. On the other hand, the way we talk about them, how we imagine them living, um, what kind of motivations we put into their heads, you know, that really tells a lot about celebrity culture and it tells us about us you know? mm. and I, you know i think one of the things that you find is all these stories of you know, slightly excessive sexual activity on the part of the emperor well in a way that's about a popular projection you know what what would it be like what would you do if you could sleep with anybody in the world so your new book, in which you're telling us about the lives of the emperors, this is not a, a book that goes chapter by chapter through each emperor, it's about what the emperor's life was like, what the job was like. But I am interested, you start with this character, Elagabalus, um, who was, as well as everything else, very young and from Syria. Yes. We might come back to that in a minute. But he's also supposedly famous for smothering his guests in rose petals. He's famous for almost every crime you could commit. Why did you choose him as your starting point? Um, Elagabalus is partly invented, I think. He's a, you know, he's a true character. He comes to the throne at 14 and he's assassinated when he's 18. And, we know that. You know, and we pretty well know that. You have to be very, very sceptical mm -hmm. not to believe that. Um, he's probably controlled partly by the army, partly by his mum. Uh, but he becomes a kind of vessel into which Romans pour all their hatred of imperial power. And so the one story that has always captured people's attention when they hear about him is smothering his guests with rose petals. You know, he invites his mates to dinner, lovely evening. Uh, at the end, uh, he plays a trick that we know other emperors have play played before, which is ceiling opens and rose petals fall on top of the guests. Brilliant, you know. Very, it's very Instagrammable. It is, absolutely. And uh, the only trouble is that Elagabalus doesn't know where to stop. So, so many rose petals come down that the guests smother and die. And I think it's a great story because, partly because it's, is so far-fetched and you go through or I went through a, a kind of sort of set of stages and I thought this can't be true you know I don't believe this is true and then I saw well it's not literally true I bet we can't test it but it's probably not but it's true in a kind of a, a kind of higher level yeah. there's a there's a kind of a sense of truth in that which is not whether it whether he really did it or not and it seemed to me the sense of truth was uh, it was a moral lesson that when emperors are being very, very generous to you, they can also kill you. 
so many of these stories are or include um, scheming yeah. women. Why is it the case that women throughout these stories are depicted as evil, ambitious, scheming poisoners? I think there's two answers to that. One is women within a court culture, within a secret court culture, behind palace walls, with one man ruler, they often do acquire more power than women had ever had before, certainly mm. in Rome. So someone who has power over the emperor is someone who can whisper in his ear. So his wife does, his barber does, his slaves do, so forth. So there's a sense in which there probably is female influence much more. But I think also it's a bit of misogyny on the part of Roman writers followed by modern writers. You know, if you want to know why things go wrong in the palace, you know, why that poor guy died or that person became the heir, well, the easy solution is to say, blame the woman. It's the woman, it's his mum that did it. And, you know, I'm capable of doing that. I say, Elagabalus, perhaps a bit ruled by his mum, but we do it now, you know. Boris Johnson, you know, British press, repeatedly say, why did you do that? Well, that's because his wife Carrie told him to. When you think about the emperors that you favour or the emperors that you might have wanted to sit within the Palatine Hill having dinner, who do you choose? Oh, who should we be looking oh, at? Blimey, I mean, I think if I was to kind of be miraculously transported mm -hmm. back to ancient Rome, I'd probably prefer to sit with the girl who washed out the baths at the end of the evening and find out what her stories were. Uh, but if I had to choose an emperor, um, and I can't have Elagabalus, I think I'll go to the extraordinarily virtuoso Nero, just to see what he was like. I've been to Rome, I've been to the Palatine, where his palace was, and I've sat in the dining room that he would have sat in. And I suppose it would be quite fun to see what it would be like if he was there too. And what do you expect? What would he be like if he, if he were to walk out? Uh, there is a terrible, terrible possibility that he might be more boring than we think. <laughs> God forbid, there is nothing boring. There is not a boring word or a boring story in this incredible book. Mary Beard, thank you for sharing a little bit of it with thank us this evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you.